uh, uh, we are doing on uh, atheism and uh, um, Dr. Hassan kindly uh, did very excellent and nice presentation and solved this conundrum of this uh, uh, difficult question sometime posed by the atheist, uh, which uh, particularly our younger generation found it difficult sometime to answer. And uh, you have uh, nicely set the scene from the last uh, presentation and today you're going into more details. And uh, we asked the people to, and particularly you to ask the questions and uh, we have some uh, questions uh, sent to us by email and uh, on the group uh, as a direct messages. So Hanan will be uh, asked, uh, I mean, going through all these questions at the end of the presentation. So without any delay, I will ask uh, Dr. Hussain Raza Muhammad to start his presentation, inshallah. Thank you very much. I'm just going to... Um, share slides there we go have they come through yes we can see that fantastic right أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In last week's discussion, we looked at some of the common questions that atheists often pose against people who believe in God. We deconstructed some of the common accusations that are leveled against believers in God and those who adhere to particularly Abrahamic faiths. Insha'Allah, we'll sort of continue in the same vein of thought, uh, and it does continue quite nicely for many of the questions that came up after last week's discussion as well, uh, that we'll look at some of the positive proofs for the existence of God and some of the more simple ones, more intuitive ones, uh, and uh, we'll also have um, a little look at atheism uh, as well. Uh, so, and, and the crux of the matter is whether theism is more reasonable than atheism. Now, one of the concepts that I mentioned last week is that when we have this belief in God, when we subscribe to a religion that has evolved over so many centuries, uh, particularly the religion of Islam, which according to our beliefs has evolved in addition to what has happened to Christianity and Judaism before, we have a very complex theological and philosophical structure that has been put together by some of the greatest minds that have ever graced this earth some of the greatest thinkers who have ever been created. And as such, we sometimes find ourselves on the back foot when we are asked a, a difficult question. And sometimes someone who has very little knowledge of the subject, they can ask a question which has us immediately reeling for answers. And this happens more so when we look at the discussion regarding atheism and theism, because that's where things get a lot more complicated than we find in some interfaith uh, discussions. Uh, and this is true of any complex discipline. If you take the example of quantum mechanics now, there are some principles in there, such as uh, the collapse of the wave particle function, which if you were to describe it to a lay person, they can ask a very simple question, which would require someone with some knowledge of the field to be able to answer. And we find a similar sort of situation in uh, religious thought as well. Not, not quite at the level of quantum mechanics, but certainly in the same realm. And I thought I'd begin by setting the logical landscape a little bit, because uh, I certainly know for myself when I was growing up and, and a lot of people now, a lot of Muslims and a lot of believers in God, they grow up with this idea, uh, a noble idea, but one which is slightly misguided. And that is the, the notion that belief in God is obvious. Anybody who doesn't believe in God is foolish and they're denying the obvious facts in front of them. And as such, the idea, the supposition is going into the discussions and starting to learn about the subject. We think that I have to be able to prove my uh, religion and I have to be able to prove the existence of God to the level of mathematical proof. That is to 100% certainty. But alas, outside of mathematical equations, proof in the, in the mathematical sense of the term is very rare to come by. And in fact, if we set ourselves that bar, not only for this discussion, but for any of the great questions of existence, we will be left wanting. And so I wanted to start off today's talk by looking at 
atheism and the bar that it sets. Because very often before you try and realize how reasonable it is to believe in something, you look at how reasonable the alternatives are. And if you have the most reasonable option, it means that you are on the right tracks. So we'll begin by looking at some of the issues with atheism. Uh, and particularly, I'm going to be targeting it towards naturalism. That is the belief only in the physical world. Now, if we take God out of the equation, well, I'm sure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me. But if we take Allah out of the equation for a little bit, we are left with what? A world of mass of energy, of blind, indifferent physical forces. And it is very easy to look upon the galaxies and the stars and to look at this world and to wonder what the point of it all is. We look around at both the suffering, the absolute negative, but also the vastness of all of space. And we wonder, what is it all for? One of the great minds of history, Leo Tolstoy, perhaps the greatest novelist who's ever lived, a truly profound thinker, author of War and Peace. He was stuck with this uh, conundrum and he found himself wondering about the pointlessness of existence. What did he say? In this difficult situation where his very being was challenged, he came up with four potential solutions. He said either he can retreat into a childhood-like ignorance of the problem, basically pretend the conundrum doesn't exist, number one. Number two, pursue a life of mindless hedonism. Number three, drag on with life, knowing that it has no direction or meaning or purpose, or finally be logically consistent and commit suicide, end his life. And for many years, he had his rope and his guns hidden from him so that he couldn't act on this impulse. And he actually, at one point, exclaimed it was a marker of true uh, logical consistency and bravery to take this fourth step, which was the only rational one going forward. Because after all, if you reduce the world down merely to physical forces, what is there beyond the material world? One of the most famous paintings uh, ever uh, painted screen by Edvard Munch. Uh, I'm sure most of you would have seen it. The inspiration behind it was this existential angst. It was a moment where he is walking and all of a sudden he is struck with the enormousness and the grandiosity of the universe at large. And he said that I heard the enormous infinite scream of nature. Now, it's quite important to state here, and I will emphasize again as we go through, that I'm, number one, speaking predominantly about naturalism. That is the type of atheism that subscribes to the lack of a metaphysical, that we rely purely on the, the physical world. And a lot of the criticisms will apply to many other forms of atheism as well, but more precisely it is naturalism. And that is the type of atheism that the new atheists subscribe to, people like Richard Dawkins uh, and, and Sam Harris, number one. Number two is I don't want to uh, sort of fall into that category of a superiority complex. When you are arguing a position, it doesn't mean that the opposition is foolish, number one. And number two, any of the claims that I make in the talk are regarding whether Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists or not, not whether we believe in him. So that distinction is quite key. Number two, and number three, the first part of the talk, we are looking at the bar of reasonableness required. I am not construing it to say that it means that we must believe in God as a result of the first few slides. So when we reduce the material world down to the physical, why does it become so difficult? Why does the universe suddenly seem so pointless and absurd? And the reason is because we lose two profound things. Number one is meaning and purpose that if this universe is but an accident, an aberration in the void, that there are but blind physical forces and an arbitrary quantity of energy and mass has undergone various different processes over billions of years, perhaps longer than that, then what is the meaning behind it? There's no sense behind it. And we also lose the idea of objective value, that is morality in general, an objective morality, that we can truly say something is good or something is evil. Because you can't take morality under a microscope. You can't test for it in a lab. There's no scientific empirical way to be able to identify it, either with meaning and purpose or with morality. And we'll look at the implications of both. Uh, Carl Sagan, famous uh, 20th century popularizer of science and, and one of my uh, favorite scientists of the last century, 
but he was, a, he was a, an avowed atheist. And on looking at this picture, the image I put below him, that little blue dot in that uh, sunbeam on the bottom right hand of the frame, that is the planet Earth as taken by uh, one of the spacecrafts that was sent out. And on looking at that, Carl Sagan, he reflected profoundly on it. And one of his reflections was that on the scale of worlds, to say nothing uh, of stars or galaxies, humans are inconsequential, a thin film of life on an obscure and solitary lump of rock and metal. And there are countless other scientists and profound thinkers who have come across the same sort of conclusion that ultimately when we look, the more we understand about the intricacies and the majesty of the universe, the more we're left pondering about its abject uselessness. Again, once we have removed God from the equation, who is a designer and who has that inherent purpose, who is the absolute. And as such, in the grand scheme of things, what is the difference between the life that we lead, a noble one or an evil? Just to take two examples, it's Zaz Hassan, who was that famous Pakistani 15 year old kid at school. He saw a suicide bomber going to his school which had more than 2000 students. He rugby tackled that suicide bomber to the floor and he lost his life in the process of saving all of his classmates. And on the other hand, we have a man called Shiro Ishii. This was the uh, Japanese general who was in charge of unit 731 during the second world war. What enacted some of the most, some of the biggest tragedies that have been uh, carried out in human history. I, it's so horrific the kind of experiments that they did that I can't really talk about them from, from this platform. But again, if there's no meaning or purpose in the universe, if there's no goal, no direction, no up, no down, then what is the difference between these two? Ultimately, any action we ever do, it is lost into the infinite void. If we make a difference to the earth, the earth will end. If we make a difference to our galaxy, the galaxy will end. And if you make a difference to the universe, the universe itself will come to an end, at least in the heat death of the universe, where all energy will be spread out so far that there will be no uh, meaningful existence in the way that we understand. We become like lambs awaiting a slaughter, like a prisoner who awaits his execution. We are here without any ultimate uh, direction or meaning. And more harrowing than that, and what actually we can directly infer from it is the absence of any good or bad in the world either. Any truly objective sense of right or wrong, good or evil. Because number one, again, if we limit the world down to the physical forces uh, and, and only to what we can empirically test, we lose any sense of morality because that is a metaphysical concept. It is something beyond the mere physical senses. And if we take that a step further, so that's the existence of moral values but also duties, even if we accept that moral values exist, moral duties, that is the necessity for us to follow them is lost. Because if there is no life after this, if there is no judgment, if there is no compensation, no reward, no punishment, then ultimately there's nothing which really holds me to these values, even if I claim that they exist. The only thing that matters, of course, is the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. And this is not from me. This is not uh, something that uh, I as a theist sit down and, and contemplate what perhaps atheists might be thinking when they look at, at the universe. But it is a common theme. Dawkins himself, for example, says in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it or any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if at bottom there is no design, no purpose, no evil, no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares, DNA just is, and we dance to its music. There are countless thinkers who have come to this conclusion, and one of the most famous and brilliant atheists of all time is a man called David Hume, Scottish philosopher. And he was directly responsible for the rise of Immanuel Kant. And he argues the very same when it comes to morality, that if you simply hold the physical world into account and we look at the empirical sciences, that is the description of what is, we can never make that jump to what ought to be. So for example, from a scientific perspective, I can understand how a certain poison works. I can understand the chemistry. I can understand the transmitters in the body that it will bind to what nerves it'll block, the damage it will cause, 
but science will never tell me what I should do with that poison. And anyone who tries to go against that, who tries to derive morality from science, they are left wanting because Hume's guillotine is something which is too uh, powerful. And I was reading this novel recently, Catch-22, quite a, a, a well-known novel. And near the end, you get this sort of sense of purposelessness that echoes throughout it. Yossarian, who is the protagonist, he's walking around the city uh, and he sees uh, so many miseries and he wonders at the meaning of it all. And this little passage is when he's in a plane and his friend Snowden, he is hit by shrapnel. And as Yossarian moves his, his life jacket off him, his guts spill out all over the floor as he dies slowly in front of his eyes. And Yossarian, he reflects, Yossarian was cold too and shivering uncontrollably. He felt goose pimples clacking all over him as he gazed down despondently at the grim secret that Snowden had spilled all over the messy floor. It was easy to read the message in his entrails. Man was matter. That was Snowden's secret. Drop him out of a window and he'll fall. Set fire to him and he'll burn. Bury him and he'll rot like other kinds of garbage. The spirit is gone. Man is garbage. And indeed, when we reduce the man to the physical, that is what we are left with. And it's important that I'm talking about morality. It's about moral ontology, not moral epistemology. Moral ontology is the, uh, the origination of morality in its sense, that there is an objective foundation to it that we can use as a standard moving forward. And moral epistemology is where we know that morality exists, we accept morality as a thing, and then we use scientific means or whatever other means it is to try and refine it. And on a naturalistic perspective, there is no moral ontology, but there is plenty of moral epistemology. This is the classic sort of error that people like Sam Harris fall into when they talk about the scientific foundations uh, of, uh, of, of morality, which of course Einstein here, uh, he, he rubbishes. And this reflection hit one philosopher particularly hard, a man by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the most brilliant uh, atheist philosophers um, who, who's ever lived. And he, he puts it in a parable the parable of the madman. And, and in this, he talks about the death of God. And, and very often people, especially theists, they're sort of put off. They say, oh, he said, God is dead. He popularized the saying. But when he said it, it was no insult, although he dismantled the institutions of Christianity. The man who runs into the market, he panics. He worries about the loss of God. Because once you take God out of the equation, we have lost that center, that locus around which all revolves. And he, amongst other things, the full quote is on the slides, that we wonder now, what are we doing when unchanged from this earth, this earth from the sun? Whither is it moving now? Where are we going? Are we not plunging continually? Is there still any up or down? Or are we straying through an infinite nothing? And the full parable is, it's, it's quite short, but it's available online if anyone wants to, wants to look into it. And the translation of this, once you remove meaning and purpose and morality from existence as a whole, then we are left wanting. And it, we are left with a practically impossible way to live our lives, that what we say in theory never translate into practice. And again, this is something which is, which is accepted by a number of naturalists. Bertrand Russell, for example, again, full quote is here, we don't have time to go through everything, but he finishes by saying that his philosophy, it is founded on the firm foundation of unyielding despair. And Albert Camus, the famous philosopher behind uh, absurdism, says that you look at the absurdity of nature, the ridiculousness of, of all that is, and you just have to imagine that it's okay. And he gives the example of Sisyphus, the, uh, the uh, man who was punished by the Greek gods for, treaty, uh, for uh, tricking death. And his punishment was to lift a stone up the mountain every day to get it to the top. But every time it got close, it was charmed that it would fall down again. And he just pushes the stone up and it falls down, up and down, and he doesn't achieve anything. And that is the parable that Camel accepts for this world and for our lives here. But he says we have to pretend that Sisyphus is happy. Now, again, I'm not accusing atheists of being immoral, valueless, purposeless zombies. That would be hubris, it would be inappropriate, and it's frankly not true because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. And it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is whether we believe in him or not. And his, his rahmah, it encompasses all the universe, both theists and atheists. 
But so far, we haven't started any of the proofs for the existence of God. This kind of shows us what the other side has to offer, what is there, what we're competing against. Because very often, we're always on the back foot because we are the ones who are being asked the questions. Uh, and sometimes when you reverse the meter and you ask the questions of the other side, you realize that actually they have tougher qu questions to answer uh, than we do. And there are ways to take this. For example, you can take the, the argument from objective morality and use it in the moral argument for the existence of God. Or you can talk about the practical impossibility of atheism and use a William Jamesian kind of pragmatic approach, not a pragmatistic, but a pragmatic approach to, to proving God's existence. But I haven't done that here. So we'll now look at two of the main proofs for the existence of God. And I've chosen these two not because they're the strongest arguments, because they're not. But I've chosen them because they are the most intuitive. They're two of the arguments that we kind of feel ourselves. We, we sort of know them. And the idea is to take that sort of knowing and refine it a little bit so that we understand it formally and we can answer some of the common objections that are put against them. The first one is the Kalam cosmological argument. And I've chosen a relatively uh, one of the weaker forms, let's say, compared to some of the stronger forms out there. But it's quite brilliant in its simplicity. We have premise number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Premise number two, the universe begins to exist. Conclusion, the universe has a cause. The argument is valid. The conclusion, it of course follows from the premises, but the question is, are the premises true? Once you have a valid argument, what can be attacked is the premises, the truth of the premises. Now, most arguments are actually targeted against premise number two. But recently, there have been some who have attacked premise number one, and they argue that perhaps the universe didn't uh, have, a, 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 that the universe could come from nothing, and that something can come from nothing. And probably the most uh, well-known uh, proposer of this idea is Lawrence Krauss. He's uh, created some ripples in the debate in his book, A Universe from Nothing. But Ironically, when he approaches this idea of nothing, he redefines the word uh, itself. And he tries to take the argument away from philosophical discourse and put it into scientific, scientific discourse. But it's a classic, again, issue that we have with a lot of the new atheists, people like Dawkins uh, or, or Krauss, or even some other atheist thinkers such as Stephen Hawking. And the reason why this argument falls flat is because he commits what is known as the equivocation fallacy. That is that, in the same argument, he will use two different definitions of the word nothing. On the one hand, when we talk about nothing in a real sense, we talk about no thing, something that is absent. If, for example, you had nothing for lunch and I asked you, what did it taste like? You would correctly be confused. There's no way to answer that question because you can't pin affirmative qualities on something that doesn't exist. When he talks about nothing, and when many scientists talk about nothing or about a vacuum, they're not talking about nothing in a real sense. They're talking about something. It is the absence of matter, perhaps, in an ideal sense, but it is permeated by fields. For example, when we look at, at uh, Hawking radiation and the decay of black holes, which involve the propagation of virtual particles, they, don't, they pop in and out of existence, yes, but not out of nothing. There are uh, quantum fields that exist there within, particularly around black holes, for example, around the very powerful gravitational fields. So when Lawrence Krauss says a universe from nothing, he rather means a universe from almost nothing. But did the universe exist? Did it begin to exist? Well, there are four arguments that we can give in order to try and say that the universe did begin to exist. And it is where most of the scientific evidence points anyway. We'll look at two philosophical arguments and we'll look at two scientific arguments. Bear in mind, it does get a little bit complicated. So if any of the proofs are a bit complicated, feel free to write down a question. We can go through it at the end. Or if your head's completely spinning, then just try and write it out and reset at the next point. The first proof uh, about the impossibility, the philosophical impossibility of the universe uh, existing forever is one based on the impossibility of an actual infinite. And we touched on this last week in the Q&A. And that's the argument that an infinite, which is comprised of components, that is uh, a certain number of, of, of components add together to form what is actually infinity is impossible in the physical world. 
It's possible in mathematics. You can describe, for example, sets of numbers, like the set of all real numbers. But you can't translate that theoretical uh, coherent discussion into practical reality. And I'll give two examples to display that. Number one, if you have a library of infinite books, right? It's actually full of an infinite number of books. And you take out every other book. How many books have you taken out? Infinite. How many have you left behind? Infinite. So you've taken every single book out, but you've also left every single book behind. Doesn't work, does it? And a more profound way of looking at this is Hilbert's Hotel. And I'll only touch on it, but those who are interested, again, there's a lot more you can read into Hilbert's Hotel. And it's the idea that if you have a hotel which has infinite rooms and is actually full of an infinite number of guests, so there's no room, right? If someone comes to the front desk and asks, can I have a room, please? Rather than turning them away, you can play mathematical tricks. You can send the person from room number one into room number two, from room number two into room number three, and you move everybody on one room up, what happens? You haven't moved anyone out of the hotel, but now one of the rooms is free. So to say that the universe is infinite in its existence, that is to say that it is an actual infinite in terms of time, it does not work. It doesn't make sense because it is to claim the existence of an actual infinite, which is philosophically incoherent. Number one, philosophical proof number two is the impossibility of passing through infinite elements at one time. Now it sounds a bit complex, but it's actually quite simple. In order to display this point, I want you to count, count numbers like you've always done, right? But start from minus infinity. If you start minus infinity, what comes next? You can't possibly do it. It's not possible to say that the universe existed for an infinite number of years and that this actual infinite exists and we have passed through all of it. Why? Because if we are here now, in this moment of time, and we come across that person who claims he's been counting from minus infinite forever, and he says he's at number two, three, four, five, you can rightfully ask, well, if you started counting an infinite number of years ago, surely you should be at 100, or maybe minus 100, or 10,000, or a million. It doesn't make sense. A practical demonstration example is uh, the one that Ghazali, Imam Ghazali, he gives, which is about Saturn and Jupiter. And again, I, I touched on this last week. He says that if Saturn orbits the sun once, every time that Jupiter orbits it twice, what happens? In 10 years time, the number of times Jupiter has orbited is here and the number of times Saturn is here, right? So from 10 for Jupiter, 20 for Saturn. After 10 more years, the gap between them increases and increases and increases and increases. But if an infinite number of time passes, what happens? They have all circled the same number of times, which is infinity. It doesn't translate into the physical world. And those are the two philosophical proofs. Now we'll look at two of the scientific proofs. Number one is the expansion of the universe. That when uh, it was Edwin Hubble actually who discovered it in 1929, looking at the universe, the expectation was that when we look in different directions, we'll see both blue shift and red shift. Because when light comes, light is a wave and the speed doesn't change. So when something comes towards us, it's being squished a little bit, which means that the frequency of light, it increases, it becomes uh, bluer. We hear it, for example, the Doppler effect, we hear it in sirens going by, like you might have heard. But if something's moving away from us, that light becomes stretched and it moves more towards the red end uh, of the visible light spectrum. So the expectation was we look in different directions. Sometimes there'll be blue shift, sometimes red shift. But actually, everywhere we look, it was red shift because the universe is constantly expanding in all directions. And interestingly enough, if, if, if any of those science geeks out there, just to mess with your concepts a little bit, space is actually expanding faster than the speed of light. So objects move away from each other in a sense faster than the speed barrier of the universe itself. But if it is expanding, and we reverse that process, we eventually come to a point, the beginning, which was at the Big Bang. And other uh, theories which were uh, targeted, when the Big Bang theory first came out, by the way, the term Big Bang was actually a derisory. It was a pejorative term. And it was there to try and mock the idea because it sounded too similar to the idea of creation. There are so many scientists who try to propose other theories simply because they couldn't accept this theory. And this was, of course, a, an unintended complement to uh, the, the idea of creation. 
That's scientific proof number two at number one. And scientific proof number two is regarding the laws of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamic states that a closed system will tend towards increasing entropy. That is spreading out from a high energy state to a low energy state, from less chaos to more chaos until it reaches equilibrium. So if, for example, you take um, some colored liquid, right, uh, and you pour it into a bathtub of water, you'll see entropy increases with your own eyes, because there's a certain amount of order there that all the blue is in one place and the rest of the water is a different color. That's order. So what happens with time is the molecules begin to, to mix, and that chaos spreads out until there is equilibrium, that all of the, all of the water, it stays roughly the same tint of blue. If the universe had been existing forever, then the entropy of the universe would have had an infinite number of time to reach its equilibrium. And therefore, we already would have experienced the heat death of the universe. And as such, again, this is another scientific proof for uh, the beginning of the universe, which is, of course, the second premise of the Kalam cosmological argument. And from this argument, we can actually go a step further, which Imam Ghazali does, amongst other philosophers. And he posits something quite interesting, because when conditions are present for an effect to come into place, that effect should happen, right? If you have sub-zero temperatures and you have some liquid water in the room, if the cause is there, then the water should freeze. You don't get the cause and then whenever the effect feels like it, it comes into play. It just happens. That's the way cause and effect works. And as such, when we look at the beginning of the universe and the creation of the universe, we are struck with the same question, that if the cause was there, the conditions were there for the beginning of the universe. Why didn't it come into being? And the answer is because, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hayy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ever-living. And he decides, he says, kun fayakun. And that also is just a metaphorical description of events. He doesn't even need to say anything. Because, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not speak in, in a physical sense. And we get that additional quality from the cosmological argument. So from it, we can infer the following, that we have powerful grounds to believe in. So remember, the Kalam cosmological argument talks about a cause, okay? We haven't said God. But whatever this cause is, call it what you like. Describe it in whatever terms you wish. The qualities it contains are, number one, it is uh, beginningless, because if it had a beginning, then again, the, you know what caused that? Number two, it is uncaused. Number three, it is timeless, spaceless, changeless, immaterial, immeasurably powerful, and a personal creator of the universe. And thus, it is a very reasonable argument. Now, I just want a quick note of humility whenever we address the scientific field to understand that we are looking at things through the current lens that is available to us. Science continues to change, it continues to advance. There are huge questions that we don't fully understand, such as the coherence between quantum physics and uh, cosmology, the physics of the very big and the physics of the very small. And so this might change. In a few years' time, some of these proofs might be redundant. And that's one of the reasons why other arguments, uh, other forms of the Kalam cosmological argument are more powerful, such as the contingency argument, where we move away from the sense of a beginning and we move to a sense of what is contingent and what is necessary. It's a bit more complicated, takes slightly more time, and it's a little bit less intuitive. So I've put it on screen for those who are interested, but inshallah, perhaps at another time. So that's a lot to go through, and I'm sure that many people, your heads will be spinning. But let's hit the reset button, because we'll move on to proof number two. And that is the argument from fine-tuning. And again, this is one of those arguments that we kind of know, we kind of feel it within ourselves, right? And uh, one of the best ways that it has been voiced is by William Paley, who, who was a brilliant author. And he describes it in such a way that if you're walking down a beach and you see a watch there in the sand, you pick it up, you look at how intricate a design it is, you look at how marvelously it's crafted, how unlikely it is of all coming together, a true master class of engineering, you immediately know that it has a designer. You know that something has created it. This is the intuitive sort of element that leads us to this argument. And I've said fine tuning just to try and remove the loaded uh, association when we say design. Because when you say design argument, you immediately are implying the truth of your conclusion. But fine tuning of the universe is undeniable, as we'll go on to see. 
The question is how to explain it. And when I say fine tuning, it means the precision of both the constants of nature and the arbitrary quantities that we find in the universe are so preposterously precise to allow life to exist that it leads us to wonder about how they came to be. And there are countless examples we can give. Uh, for those who are interested, there was a 1985 book called The uh, Cosmological Anthropic Principle. I'll touch on it in a, uh, in, in a little while, uh, which looks at a lot of these numbers and how ridiculous it is for life to actually exist. If we take, for example, the gravitational constant and we change it by a factor of 10 to the power of 60, that's 10, that's 1 million, 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 million. If you change it by that much, you have no stars, no galaxies, no life. It's not a life permitting universe anymore. If you take the cosmological constant, which is important in the rate of the expansion of the universe, and you change it by a factor of one times 10 to the power of 120, that's, that's, 10, uh, that's one with 120 zeros after it then again, we would not be in a life permitting universe. And there are so many examples of numbers like this. And as human beings, we can't actually comprehend them. When I'm saying these numbers, many of you will just be thinking the word big. Okay, super big. Because we're not, we're not wired that way. We can't understand numbers that big. But to put it in perspective, the number of seconds that have passed since the beginning of the universe, since the Big Bang, 13.7 billion years ago is, to the order of magnitude of 10 to the power of 17, and the number of atoms in this universe in the realm of 10 to the power of 80. These are the probabilities that we're talking about, beyond comprehension. And many scientists, when they look at the fine tuning of the universe, they are left in awe. One of the, uh, quite an amusing look on it was by, by Fred Hoyle, who said that it, it almost suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. Uh, and Anthony Flew, who was one of the most notorious atheists of the 20th century, at the end of his life, he actually converted to Christianity when he realized how absurd uh, the, the world is in terms of its precision. Now, the argument, however, itself needs a little fine tuning from what we intuitively understand. And perhaps this is what William Paley was arguing in the first place anyway. And we approach it with the following premises. Premise number one. The fine tuning of the universe is either due to physical necessity, chance, or design. These are the three only possibilities. If there are any others, then of course they can be added, but none others have been suggested. Premise number two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance. So we argue that the chance or the physical necessity elements of the argument are eliminated. And that leaves us only with the final one, that it is due to design. But it is important to be humble with this argument. The conclusions are not quite as vast and as encompassing as we get from the cosmological arguments. And we should not bite off more than we can chew. Because number one, we are using abductive reasoning here. So there is an element of probability to it. We are saying there are three possibilities. It's, uh, Sherlock Holmes is the best to have uh, uh, described this, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, where he says that once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And then secondly, that the designer is powerful beyond our wildest conceptions, but it doesn't tell us much more than that, other than there is a designer who is immeasurably powerful. And I'll return to this multiple times because this is very important when answering some of the objections that we face. Now, there are a lot of objections that are, are, are put against this argument. And we'll go through a few of the common ones now. We'll have to skip over a couple because I am wary of time. But if they come up in the questions, we can, we can always go through them then. Question number one is classic. Who designed the design? It's like with the Callum cosmological argument. People say, well, who caused God? And the answer was already in the premises, right? That uh, only that which has a beginning needs a cause. But similarly here, People will look at the argument of fine tuning and they say, well, if that's the case, if that's your logic, then God has to be more complex than the universe. And therefore you ask simply by your logic, who designed the designer? It's a good question. But it stems from an inherent misunderstanding of the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about Tawheed, when we talk about our belief in the oneness of God, we say that Allah is Ahad. In Surah Ikhlas, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. Not Wahid, the number one. 
ahad, oneness in the absolute sense. There is no division. Allah is not murakkab. Even when we look at Allah's 99 names at a higher philosophical understanding, they're not 99 components that we put together that we end up with Allah. But actually all of them are one in the same because God is absolutely simple. There is no complexity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that we conceive the way that we talk about complexity of the universe. Perhaps the best way to try and understand is to think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the unembodied mind. That is the ultimate absolute mind which is attached to no physical being. So, number one. And also, by the way, if we look at the premises of, uh, at the scope of the argument, what we're trying to argue, that it simply means that there's a very powerful designer that is uh, not uh, targeted, it is not answered by uh, this objection. Number one. Objection number two is regarding the glitches of the universe, the so-called shortcomings. That if we say that God created the world, there are some imperfections. Now, evil and suffering itself is a, it is a different topic. It's beyond the scope because there's, there's too much to go into. Uh, but even when we look at just creation, generally, there are certain inefficiencies that we see. For example, no living creature that we're aware of, certainly that we have discovered to this point, has wheels, even though wheels are such an effective way of, uh, of transportation. But the answer to this is quite simple, that number one, that it doesn't impair the argument we're putting forward. We're talking about an intelligent designer. We're not arguing for the perfect God from this fine tuning argument. And as such, even a broken clock, if you're walking along the beach and you find the broken watch, still you would have that supposition, who is it that designed it? And number two, many of the imperfections of this world are there for a reason, they're deliberate. Because our, our purpose of being here is an asymptotic chasing after that perfection that we can never reach. The constant trying to perfect that which is imperfect. Remove it. And again, we are robbed of our purpose. Objection number three is regarding evolution. And this probably, uh, Darwin's theory probably had the biggest impact on uh, this argument. And many of the classic ways that we would look at it, if you look at some of the old texts, they would refer to things like the complexity of the human eye. And you can explain that in evolutionary terms, right? That perhaps it was even an evolutionary advantage for the detection of light. So light sensors were developed. Then we needed to know the direction of light. So then the sensors became directional. You began to get a closed system, right? And then from a closed system, perhaps it became an evolutionary advantage to be able to tell the different types of light. And so color vision was born, so on and so forth. And whilst it is a very powerful objection, it only talks, as the name suggests, about evolution, not about abiogenesis, not about the creation of life in the first place, the beginning of life from non-life. And uh, the, the chances of this happening, according to Fred Hoyle, uh, his, his famous uh, statement was about a tornado hitting a junkyard. And on the other side, you had the Boeing 747. That's the kind of chances that we're talking about. But that evolution, again, we're talking about the evolution of life, not the beginning of life, number one. And number two, this targets only genetic information. It works on life, on living things. And the constants which I provided, just as an example, were relating to the universe at large that created the conditions in which evolution could took place. And the conditions are that much more unlikely. So if we use the abductive form of the teleological argument, then uh, we are left with, uh, with that. Again, I'm, I'm wary of the time, so we don't have too much time to go through. I will skip a couple of the slides. Uh, another one is the anthropic principle. And that's the argument that we, okay, so what? Everything is ridiculously unlikely, but we wouldn't be able to comment on it unless life existed, right? Now, this argument only applies if there is a multiverse. If there was only this world, then the philosopher John Leslie, he has, he has completely destroyed the argument as the same. It is akin to being in front of a firing squad of 10 professional soldiers who all shoot at you at point blank range and they all miss. You look around, you see the chance of them missing were next to nil and you say, well, it doesn't need explaining because if I was dead, I wouldn't be able to ask the question. No, when you're alive, you suddenly realize, well, they all missed. There must be a reason that they missed. Now, it relies on the existence of a multiverse. The only way the anthropic principle can be applied is with a multiverse. So we'll look at the multiverse uh, in, in a little bit of depth. Number one, the claim itself, it may well be true. I have nothing against the theory. I'd love to see where the physics goes. 
But as such, at the moment, it is a metaphysical concept. There's no empirical proof for it just yet. It is purely theorized, number one. And number two, depending on the mechanism and the types of universe, universes that were being generated, you would argue that the mechanism itself needs fine tuning, especially if it's going to produce different types of universes that all potential universes were encompassed, which is what some proponents of the multiverse theory will argue. Number four is it is contrary to Occam's razor that it seems like an immeasurably complex way to try and answer the question, to argue about one universe you create an infinite number of other universes just to explain away this universe. Whereas the much simpler explanation is to look to the design, which is uh, logically coherent. And Alvin Plantinga's analogy is quite, quite good on this. He says that if you're playing poker, well, uh, when I open them up, but this is the example he gives. If you're playing poker and the person who's dealing out the cards, 20 games in a row, they draw straight aces, right? They win every single game. You get up, you get very angry at him. You say, what are you doing? And he looks up and he says, no, 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 no. There's an infinite number of universes. And this just happens to be the universe in which I got 20 aces in a row. How would you accept that explanation? Of course, not. you'd know that he was cheating because there is a simpler explanation. There was an intelligence behind the act, which is what we argue from the argument of fine tuning. And if the multiverse is talking about aberrations, the, the, that the world are aberrations of the void, probabilistic movements, as, as Ludwig Bolton, uh, Boltzmann argued, then smaller fluctuations are much more likely than bigger ones. It's much more likely for a small universe to exist than a larger one. And if you take this argument to its logical conclusion, therefore it is much more likely than rather the universe is large existing, that rather the only thing that exists is me, a hallucinating mind, Boltzmann's brain. And that would be the most scientifically plausible explanation, which is perhaps one of the reasons a lot of people are arguing for a simulation argument regarding uh, the universe. And number seven, different life could not have evolved because the changes that we're talking about are so profound that life itself couldn't exist. Chemistry itself wouldn't be there. There are lots of other examples uh, of arguments for the existence of God. These are only two of the very basic ones, two of the intuitive ones that I've chosen to look at to build on what we already know. Some of them are more complex, some of them are easier, and some of them you could take from what we've talked about, especially in the early part of the talk. And perhaps one of the most powerful is the argument of uh, Al-Burhan al siddiqi which is uh, one developed by Muslim philosophers. But ultimately, and this is quite quite important. If, as John Lennox, the, the brilliant uh, professor at Oxford University of Mathematics, what he says, he says that suppose that I told you that in my garden, the roses began to bloom. How would you think I came about that conclusion? Would you have thought that, ah, so of course, um, uh, Hussein, he, he sat down, uh, he thought about it really, really hard about the nature of existence, about the universe, and, and through a complex line of, of philosophical reasoning and theological interpretations and whatever else, eventually he came to the conclusion that, yes, in my garden, there must be roses bloom. Or would you suppose that simply I looked outside of my window and I experienced the flowers? Because ultimately, perhaps one of the best ways to build that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a personal level, it only works personally, is that when you are in that salah where you are concentrating so well, when you are doing that fast, what are you thinking? That feeling that we have, that spirituality, or perhaps it is akin to someone who's lost at sea, that they are praying out to their Lord. That when our hearts open and the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enters in, we experience God directly. And we know of God's existence to the same certainty that we know of the existence of the material world. Uh, they, uh, David Hart, he's written a book which addresses this quite well. It's, it's a beautiful book for those um, who are interested. One of the lesser known but absolute gems uh, of literature. And we'll conclude, of course, obligatorily, uh, absolutely couldn't avoid it on Pascal's wage. Uh, and that's the idea that we've seen what naturalism has to offer. Uh, a foundation of unyielding despair, pretending that Sisyphus is happy. All of this is there on the one side. You don't have anything. There's nothing there which is offered that if you miss out on anything, you're missing out on something because we still live our lives. 
We enjoy our lives. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us bliss in this world as well as building in our akhirah. But if we turn away from God, if we don't sincerely search for it, then what are we left with? What have we gambled? We have gambled not our temporary existence on this world, but the infinite existence of the hereafter. And that concludes uh, today's talk. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. Some have come through beforehand. So inshallah, we'll move on to the Q&A section. Yeah, assalamu alaikum everyone. Hope you guys can hear me. So inshallah, I'll be hosting the Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, please do put them in the chat. We've got emails, a lot of questions. So I'm going to just go through them quickly, inshallah. So the first question that we've uh, been emailed is that Richard Dawkins has claimed that religion would never answer the questions that science can't, uh, which leaves the matter of the universe's creation potentially unanswerable. So what would be our response to that? Um, so uh, the Dawkins argument that religion has nothing to offer about the explanation for existence? Uh, essentially that um, religion cannot answer the questions that science can or you know vice versa yeah well. gotcha gotcha so uh, again the, the the common theme that we find with Dawkins is, is that misunderstanding of uh, of religion in general uh, because I suppose when he's saying that or when people argue that they're thinking that if we open up the Quran we won't find uh, the the explanation of that or something of that description uh, perhaps Perhaps we'll never find out the scientific explanation. Perhaps it is beyond our scientific means, but that doesn't mean it's beyond our reason. So as we looked at, for example, the fine tuning argument, once we have said that it is not down to chance or down to necessity, it is perfectly reasonable. It is perfectly rational to say that therefore it would have been designed. So if he has been so obstinate in his arguments that he says, no, I'm not even going to even if anything else doesn't fill the void, I won't turn to this reasonable argument towards this belief in God, then uh, there's not much else that can be said. But as long as we know that it is reasonable, that we can argue for it and it makes sense, then we have the answer. Uh, but again, we have to dis make that distinction between the scientific explanations and different types of explanations which religion and God have to offer. Right, okay. And a question that I had just to add on to that is that obviously you've mentioned about how science, it changes and uh, different scientific theories can come with diff with time. So would you say that's one of the reasons why the argument from contingency and sort of where which leads to the necessary existence is perhaps slightly more sophisticated uh, as, you know, it's something that's been popularized quite recently that it goes outside the realm, realm of science. And so it can't, um, you know, any scientific theory that comes tomorrow cannot disprove this argument, essentially. Uh, absolutely. I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there. That is probably the one of the most important reasons why contingency arguments are a lot more powerful uh, than, uh, than, than ones based on, uh, on scientific reasoning uh, alone. Uh, and uh, also, when you use scientific means, uh, again, you're sort of starting at creation and going to the creator, which is perfectly valid, but it is not as strong as uh, 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 other approaches such as that of contingency or, uh, uh, or the argument from Burhan. Uh, so we've got a question in the chat. So how do I reply to this question, uh, presumed from an atheist? How does disproving evolution prove creation? Uh, so uh, first of all, um, if, I'm not saying that evolution has been disproved, but if let's say someone out there manages to disprove evolution, uh, which, which in my opinion would be a great shame because it's a beautiful thing. But if someone could disprove uh, evolution, uh, how does it prove religion? Uh, it doesn't necessarily prove religion, but you're left with potential options on the table. And what options do you have? The chances of life to the complexity that it has evolved, it takes those numbers we've already talked about and takes them to absolutely ridiculous levels. And as such, it is perfectly reasonable then to turn towards the idea of, of an intelligent designer, which has the explanatory power to tell us why things are the way they are. Uh, but again, I've, there's no inherent issue uh, with, with, with evolution generally. Evolution doesn't necessarily disprove God or prove God in any way. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, yes, but he is also the sustainer. It's not like he created a table and left it alone. It is like um, the universe is almost like a thought in his mind. Uh, if, if, if we um, forgive the analogical reasoning, that as soon as he decides to not sustain it anymore, it ceases to exist. 
Um, so another question in the chat is uh, one of Allah's greatest attributes is his mercy. He's told to love us 70 times more than our mother. Um, although uh, other than that, we we will be punished and rewarded based on our actions. So how can Allah assign us to something as painful as hell, despite being so merciful? Sure, sure. So it's a it's a complex question, and there's many different ways uh, in which you can answer it. Uh, the first sort of prerequisite is that when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like you said, he's absolutely merciful and he's absolutely just as well. He is fair. It wouldn't be fair for, for someone who, you know, God forbid, murdered your whole family, then to, to go get, gets away with it in this life and then ends up in heaven afterwards. It's not consistent with the justice of, of God. How can he burn us in hell? Uh, there's a number of ways in which it's perfectly uh, viable that number one, uh, it is the natural consequence of the action. It is uh, fairness. It is bringing the scales back to equilibrium, that the justice that wasn't done in this world, it is done in the next world, however long it takes in hellfire before uh, that punishment is seized. So it is number one, consistent with his justice. Punishment is very, very uh, important. If you get rid of punishment as a whole, then the whole nature, again, of binding us to our moral duties, um, it, it, to our moral values in the way of moral duties, it no longer uh, applies, it no longer exists, number one. Number two is that also when we think about hell, there are things to be said from a philosophical perspective, perhaps, again, beyond the scope of tonight's discussion, but uh, when we talk about uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, very often he'll talk about various things, for example, about paradise or about hellfire. And he'll do so with very elaborate imagery. So he'll talk about, for example, various rivers and utopian kind of picture in heaven. And he'll talk about, uh, like, let's say the tree of Zaqqum and Surat Al-Waqi'ah as, as, as just one of, of, of countless examples. Now, we have to take it with a pinch of salt. We're not fundamentalists in the idea that everything that is said is perfectly literal. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing hellfire, he takes the most horrible things we can imagine so that we can understand what kind of conditions there are. It's not necessarily fire in the sense that we understand it, number two. So there's more um, to be said to that. Uh, but most importantly is number one, that it is important with his justice. Uh, and it doesn't contradict, the idea of hell doesn't contradict a benevolent uh, creator. So um, another question that we've got emailed in is, uh, why do you resort, why do we resort to God did it for the Big Bang when a more natural answer would be, well, when we find out, um, if we ever do find out, that will be the answer to it. So why do we say God did it for the Big Bang? Sure, sure. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily say that God did it for the Big Bang. Uh, it, it, one of the, it's a natural conclusion that you can say, are based on the reasoning that we've given in the Kalam cosmological argument, but it doesn't necessarily begin at the Big Bang. Uh, to, so, so the accusation there, which is coming forward, is the God of the gaps idea. That, okay, we don't understand it yet, so you're sort of just putting it in there. And it's a valid criticism because a lot of people, they fall uh, into that route. But when we are arguing about it, we're not getting rid of the need for scientific explanation. If there was something I can't say before the Big Bang because time actually started um, with uh, the Big Bang. There was no uh, when before in the same way that there was no where. Uh, so did God do the Big Bang? Perhaps. But we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought creation into existence. How he did it? Perhaps it started at the Big Bang. Perhaps there was something else. Allahu a'lam. We investigate. We don't want our beliefs to get in the way of scientific inquiry. That we say, okay, we reached the Big Bang, alhamdulillah, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put away our lab coats, we'll, we'll shut down the telescopes, salama, alhamdulillah, we did it. No, we go further, we look more. But the arguments which we use, they don't necessarily have to start at the Big Bang. And of course, when we look at the more powerful arguments, such as those of contingency, it, it, it is irrelevant anyway. Even if the universe existed forever, it doesn't matter because the contingency argument still applies. And if anyone has any questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, to do so. But yeah, we do have more questions. So um, if God is a perfect designer, then why do our bodies have things like appendicitis and wisdom teeth, etc.? Sure, sure. So uh, there's a few ways to answer. I sort of touched in it um, in, uh, in the talk itself. Uh, but yeah, if, if we're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the perfect designer, why are these glitches, uh, why are there these glitches or, or these inefficiencies uh, in, in, in creation? Uh, 
Uh, there's a few answers uh, that we can give. First of all, many of the things that we think are glitches um, are, are, are not. So for example, tonsillitis, uh, it would a very common kind of condition. People get inflammation inside of, uh, of the tonsils at the back of the mouth uh, around uh, Valdeo's ring. And we thought that was useless for ages. We were, people were just chopping out tonsils left, right, and center until we realized that no, it actually had a very important function. Waldeo's ring was there to prevent infections from, from uh, entering via our food. Uh, and uh, we find a similar thing for the appendix. There's lots of reasons uh, you know, that are surfacing uh, in terms of the scientific evidence that we have as to the use of it. Having said that, there are still inefficiencies, let's say. So uh, if we take the example of the vagus nerve, which is uh, the 10th cranial nerve, uh, rather than going directly, which is uh, very easy, it tends, it goes underneath the branch uh, of the aorta. You know, well, you know, why, why, was, why wasn't it direct? Or if you look at the, uh, at the skull, at this part of the skull, you have something called the terion, which is the weakest part of the skull. And right underneath the terion, there is something called the middle meningeal artery. And therefore, if you sustain trauma there, if you dissect the middle meningeal artery, you have a, a big intracranial bleed. So there are things that you can validly uh, point to. Uh, and uh, it's important that when we think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, although everything is contingent upon God, it's important not to think that Allah is micromanaging all of the dials all of the time. In the creation of the universe, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a system. He allows it to go, he sustains it, but he leaves that system in place and he guides. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he works as divine winds in the realm of probability that he moves, for example, mankind towards him. By the way, for example, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So when we think of God, this conception that every single thing is being micromanaged by God immediately, in one sense it's correct in that everything is contingent on him, but in the sense that he's doing it all of the time, determining everything, it is number one, contrary to free will. And number two, it doesn't allow us as agents of free will in this system to exercise our ability to, to search for perfection. That's number two. Uh, although that answer is a little bit controversial, when you look at some of the Islamic philosophy, I have to put that disclaimer there, uh, because those who subscribe to, to Ash'ari philosophy will, um, will, will, will disagree with that statement. Uh, but number three, also many of the uh, glitches or imperfections in the world, uh, they are there that we may address them. Part of our reason on being here is that we have our free will, our agency to do what we please within the boundaries of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us. And part of that is seeking out the imperfections and trying uh, to perfect them and build on them. And any harm that comes out of them, by the way, any evil, so take appendicitis or, or take leukemia, for example, any harm that comes out of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is compensating. So when we go into the akhirah, which is the perfect world, this world is not perfect, it's far from perfect. But when we take this world into consideration with the akhirah as well, that is where Allah, he will fix the scales. So someone who suffers, for example, let's say appendicitis, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the akhirah will reward him. We have traditions as well which say this, will reward him so much he will wish that he could come back to the world to suffer some more. So what very often people like Dawkins try to do is they take the world itself, physical world, and they judge God based on it. But if you're judging God, you take the physical world, but you have to take the akhirah into consideration as well. Right, so a question that leads on to the previous uh, question based on sort of Allah's mercy is yeah. that, um, so if someone, for example, has committed a murder, then hell is a punishment they deserve. But what about smaller sins in comparison? So like, for example, not wearing the hijab or listening to music, would these sins, would these sins still lead to one going to hell? Sure. So uh, first of all, there are different levels um, to hell and there's different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he uh, enforces his justice. Uh, many a time we'll find that we get punished in this world for uh, the sins that we have committed. We will have done some things which uh, were wrong. And as a result, what goes around comes around and Allah, he evens the scales here. So for example, if someone has committed small sins, then Allah might punish us here and it is part of his mercy. Um, as for the statement that a murderer definitely deserves to go to hell, again, only Allah is the absolute judge. And the reason I say that is 
people are raised in different conditions. They have different influences on them. They, some people have mental health conditions. Other people have abusive childhoods. They may have uh, issues with uh, understanding morality. They might uh, have all sorts of different reasons why they committed that action. The reason why God's justice is so perfect, it is so profound beyond anything human beings could ever attain is because Allah can take every single thing, even the minutest thing, the effect of seeing your father smoke once out of the window. What effect that had on your decisions? Allah takes everything into consideration when he judges. And therefore, the punishment that he gives will be proportional to what is just and what is deserved. And there are different levels to hell, number one. Um, so it's not everything is, is necessarily burning in fire, uh, number one. And number two is that hell is not necessarily eternal either. There are people, for example, who will have short stints as a result to, to purify them before they go up to a lower level of paradise. Okay, so I've got a question um, that's just been asked. So God knows that some will fail the test. So I think it's, again, you've touched up on this. Um, so God knows that some will fail the test, so they may commit suicide, for example. So why did he, why did he create such people? Yeah, so uh, again, on suicide, I, I, I would be very careful. Uh, to say that they have failed uh, the test. Again, I would not, absolutely would not pass that judgment on them. Uh, honestly, I, I have a lot of experience in working uh, in, in psychiatry, in psychiatric hospitals with people who have profound mental health conditions, some of which are personality disorders. So we can't actually identify anything wrong specifically in the brain. It's not organic, let's say. Uh, and then you have people who have actual uh, psychological um, issues that you can pin down to uh, chemical imbalances in the brain. So something like schizophrenia, uh, for example, of which a massive proportion go on to commit suicide. Uh, so if someone commits suicide, Allah is the judge. Okay, Allah will take everything into, uh, into consideration when he, uh, when he judges them for the actions that they did. It's not necessarily that they have failed. Having said that, there will be people who genuinely fail. Right? We, we won't be able to identify them, but Allah with all the information can. So why would God create a world in which people would fail? And again, it goes back to this notion of free will. The whole point of our existence is to exercise our free will in our pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we are here. That is our, our, our purpose in, in, in this universe. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it impossible for any of us to fail, it limits our potential. And that whole test element is gone. What's the point of doing the test if no one can fail? Then we become like angels who, of course, they're very high and lofty, but they aren't as great as a, as, as a human being can be when we have the potential of disaster that we go and we achieve something great. And those that bring more suffering and evil into this world, that is an opportunity for the greatest good, far greater than what can be created directly, is the good that rises out of that black abyss of darkness and misery. That is the ultimate kind of good, that compound good, which otherwise doesn't exist. So in short, why would Allah create people that would fail? Uh, that uh, Number one, because it, is, it was necessary for free will. And uh, number two, uh, such is the mechanism of the universe when it is allowed to run at its course. Well, another question is, um, what, do you think that we could be happy in heaven for eternity if uh, some of our loved ones aren't there with us and we know that they're suffering in hellfire? Sure. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, could we possibly be in ultimate bliss if we know that a relative is suffering uh, in hellfire? So uh, if someone is suffering in hellfire for eternity, uh, which is is unimaginably rare, like for any of our relatives or people that we know to be in hellfire forever, they've got to be pretty bad, as in knowing everything which they're doing uh, is wrong, deliberately doing it as bad and as horrendous as they can. Uh, so the, 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 the claim that one of our relatives could be in hell, very, very unlikely that they'd be in hell forever, even if they're in hell for, for, for a certain time. However, still, it is possible that you know, one of our relatives is. So the question still stands, even if it's less likely. So uh, the answer is, let's say, twofold. On the one hand, in heaven, we do have that um, eternal bliss that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he grants to us. The mechanism of its granting, Allahu a'ad, 
right? Some might argue that perhaps we, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it that we don't feel that pain when we think about it. He removes that because that feeling of, um, of guilt or sadness on their behalf, it's not justified. It's not right. Logically, it's incoherent because that person deserves what they're getting. But that emotion that you're feeling as a result, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can dampen that down as part of the eternal bliss. It is, of course, within his power. Uh, the reason I say dampen down rather than to make you forget the person entirely is because obviously we define ourselves much by the people that we know. Uh, so if you were to erase, for example, you know, a close relative from your memory, is it really you who is there? But certainly to dampen the feeling, it is well within Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power uh, to make that happen. And also there are different levels of paradise. It's not absolute eternal bliss in the ultimate sense of things for all people. Perhaps that compunction that we feel is a part of a punishment for something we did. So um, if humans are born in this world to reach perfection uh, with free will through challenges, why are children created who die and then go to heaven? Could we all not go to heaven without with the suffering? Sure. So the issue of children, that's a very complicated uh, question. And there's a number of different answers to it, of which I'll, I'll posit a couple. Number one is that unfortunately, and may Allah have rahma on all of their souls, and may Allah make it easy for those who have lost their children. For uh, children who, who do die, it is a, an, an immeasurable tragedy. And to put into words how difficult it is, both for the child that undergoes something like chemotherapy before they pass away, and for the parents that are left behind, it can't be put into words. Uh, it, it can only be, be felt uh, by those who have gone through it. Uh, and the compensation for that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it fair that they get paradise as a result. That whatever harms they, they got, that certainly at least their existence wasn't something which was overall negative. That all the horrors which they had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them paradise in order to, to put it back up, number one. Number two is that as part of the system that Allah has created for us to exercise our free will in this world, there is... Uh, that uh, ne necessity that we have the ability to uh, uh, commit sins and for those imperfections to be there, that we go after them to try and remedy them, that we have these noble efforts to raise money for charity in order to try and eliminate things like childhood cancers and reduce uh, infant mortality uh, or, or childhood mortality. So it is part of that. And they are unfortunately a consequence as a result of that system. And of course, they are compensated for it, number two. And number three, you could go a step further and, and, and perhaps there is theological evidence for this too. But someone who dies in their childhood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he may test them in other ways. So first of all, they are tested in their own right, whatever they have. But perhaps you could argue for some tests they had before this creation. Or after this life, they may be tested in another way. That at least their creation was one where they had the potential to rise above angels like all other humans are. And that is something which is philosophically consistent and doesn't necessarily go against any Islamic teachings. And just the last few questions here. So mm -hmm. we've got a um, very interesting question here. Why does time exist? So you've got Albin, Albert Einstein's comment that the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. Uh, so what is kind of the Islamic understanding of why time exists? Yeah, that's a, it's a beautiful statement. Yeah, a beautiful quote. Uh, so what is time? So... Uh, in order to answer the question, it's important to understand what time is. Uh, now, what many of us might think, and certainly what human beings thought up until uh, Einstein, was that time was this immutable reality, uh, that whether anything existed, whether the universe existed, uh, whatever was going on, you can almost imagine there was a clock that was just ticking and time was going. And bit by bit, however long or whatever happened was irrelevant. Um, what Einstein proved with his theory of general relativity and special relativity is that this is not the case. Time is very much a feature of this world in the same way as space. It is, um, according to a basic understanding, let's say it's like a fourth dimension. If I say I'm going to meet you and I give you three coordinates, I'm saying I'm gonna meet you outside of my house and that's it. I leave you with three coordinates, X, Y, and Z. Uh, I haven't told you when. So you go outside of my house tomorrow, but I'm going to go there next week. That fourth dimension hasn't been met. And you can mess with time. 
special relativity, if we travel, well, any speed we travel at, but you begin to see it when you travel close to the speed of light, you start to bend time. When you move very fast, if anyone's seen uh, the movie Interstellar, by the way, you'll understand um, what I'm saying, that if you're moving very, very fast, you, for you, time uh, feels like it's going the same, but everybody else's time, it speeds up. So you can travel through time. You can literally travel in the future. If I travel to the moon at the speed of light and back, I would have traveled into the future. Uh, and same with gravity. And this is where interstellar comes into play. That with very powerful gravitational forces, as per general relativity, that gravity morphs not just space, but it also morphs time as well. And that is why time began to exist at the Big Bang, where there was infinite gravity. Beyond that point, there was uh, no time. What is the Islamic look on time? Well, number one is that the understanding that time is, it is a scientific entity, it is a, it is a measurable. We can do this empirically, by the way, such as the decay of muons as they fall near the speed of light coming through the atmosphere. Uh, so we completely and utterly accept the, the scientific explanation, number one. But number two, we look at time in more a practical sense. Time is a currency. It is a certain amount that Allah has given us. We don't even know exactly how much that currency is. But we have started, that's all we have in this world. And then we take that time and we put it in our salah, we put it in our work, we put it in our family, perhaps we put it in some sin, whatever else it is. And as we go through life, that is constantly emptying, like ice melts, until eventually we run out. And that is time for us to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, and a question that links to this is what existed before the Big Bang or before creation and what atheists would ask what existed before God? Obviously, you've answered that in the sense that God is uh, eternal, but that's um, that's a question if you want to just quickly. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so relating to God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolute and infinite in all conceivable directions. Uh, and as such, there was no beginning to God. There was no before God um, in the same way that there's nothing before minus infinity, um, if, uh, if that makes sense, or nothing beyond infinity. Allah always was, Allah always is, and Allah always will be. And that means that Allah is not within time. Time is Allah's creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we exist in a timeline that we're moving. And we can mess with the timeline with gravity and with speed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in that timeline. If you have a bike, for example, which is spread across a doorway, you cut it across a spatial plane. Half is in the door, uh, half is in the room, half is outside of the room. But you can also cut it across temporal planes as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists not just in this time, but in every time. So for God, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are, uh, we are uh, for example, being created. We are being born. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Nabi Adam has come to this earth. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, each and every one of us is being put in hell and heaven. You know, preferably the latter. So time is Allah's creation. To ask what was before time, it doesn't make sense uh, for, from a, for, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for what was before the Big Bang, uh, the honest answer is we have no idea. And it's really cool. It's so exciting that that sort of realm that we don't understand. So we use terms like singularity, right? So for example, at the, at the middle of a big, uh, of, a, of a black hole, we call it a singularity, say it has infinite gravity, infinite density. It doesn't mean anything. If you ask a physicist what it means, it just essentially means we don't understand. It doesn't mathematically work. And same with the Big Bang. What happens at that point, we can calculate, we're ever getting ever closer, especially with Large Hadron Colliders simulating the conditions in the early universe. What was before that, if time began there? We certainly can't say before in a temporal sense, maybe in a causal, in a different philosophical sense, there could be something else. Again, it could, for example, be a, a, a multiverse. There could be the universe as a bubble within something else. Allahu a'lam. But inshallah, we will find out, hopefully. Well, Jazakallah, you have answered almost all questions. We have two other questions, but they are more of theological sort of view. If you want to take it, I will put it on. And after these two questions, we will finish our presentation today. Mm -hmm. So one is that question from the child, uh, how it's going on, how does the age work in heaven if you die old or as a child, do you stay at that age? So uh, I assume it's more of a belief role than any uh, relevant to talk. Uh, yeah, oh, it's, it's, it's a very good question. Uh, absolutely. If you die um, old and very decrepit and disabled, are you stuck like that uh, forever? Uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, the answer is, is no. Uh, 
when we are in Jannah, we are in our prime. Uh, we are in our absolute. Whether we're in our physical bodies or not, that's slightly controversial. We'll put that to the side. But let's talk as if that is the case. When God gives us heaven, he gives us the best. So we will be in, a, in the best physical state imaginable. Whether whatever age that is, it may vary from person to person. There's no necessary strict rule to it. But we'll be fighting fit. Don't worry. We'll be able to enjoy everything, uh, everything up there. And the last question with regard to pluralism, if person is generally good person, but is not a Muslim, can they go to heaven? And if they can, what is the purpose, purpose of uh, there being one right religion? Uh, this is an excellent question. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, I uh, thank you very much for whoever, whoever put this forward. So uh, there's two parts to it. Question number one is uh, about religious pluralism. Question number two is uh, about uh, the point of it all if we agree with religious pluralism. So the answer, quite frankly, is absolutely yes. Non-Muslims, many non-Muslims will go to heaven. There is no question about it. Uh, and uh, the reason why the arguments for it are, are profound, the, it is consistent with the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many people, they never heard about the religion of Islam. How can they be Muslim? Number one. Number two, like you said, some people are genuinely incredible people. They're some of the most phenomenal people we've ever seen who've accomplished much more than most Muslims. And yet we condemn them to hellfire. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards them for what they did. Again, from Surah Zalzala. Everyone who's done an atom's weight of good will see to it. Everyone who's done an atom's weight of bad will see the consequence. So it is inconsistent with God's justice to claim that all non-Muslims uh, will go to hell. Uh, and uh, number three, uh, I think it's also very important psychologically for Muslims. Uh, one of the, the beautiful criticisms that uh, Jesus in the Bible, he gives against uh, Judaism is this notion of a selected people. That there's one passage in particular, I forget the reference, where uh, there's a, a Jew who sort of sits back and, and celebrates. And he thinks, I can't wait to get to the kingdom of heaven. And, and Jesus admonishes him. He says, what are you talking about? What makes you think you're going to get there just sitting here doing nothing? And if we believe that all Muslims go to heaven and all non-Muslims go to hell, we allow that complacency and superiority complex to come into place. And we sort of develop this kind of caste system, which is, which is detrimental uh, to number one, uh, living coherently in society. And also number two, sincerely, that everyone you meet, they're gonna burn in hellfire forever. It's very difficult to, to go about like that. Uh, so, but the obvious follow-up question of that is, well, um, what is the point then for there to be one true religion? Because as Muslims, we believe that Islam is the, the truth, right? We definitely believe that other religions have truth, but the most true religion, let's say, we would argue is Islam. Uh, so number one, we shouldn't get too lost in labels um, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks uh, beyond uh, labels. He looks into actions. Of course, actions speak louder than words. But what is the point then of being a Muslim? Like we go through all that effort right? We fast in Ramadan. I mean, subhanAllah, especially in the UK, right? 21 hour fasts, 20 hour fasts, depending on your fiqh for the time of Fajr, subhanAllah, right? Uh, and we don't drink alcohol, we um, stay away from all sorts of haram that some people seem to enjoy, even though ultimately when we look at most of it, it's for our physical benefit as well as for the akhara. And yet there'll be someone else who goes and they indulge in all the haram they like, and yet they might have it. How, how is that fair then? Why do I have to subscribe to Islam? It goes down again to the justice of God, but let me be a bit more precise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges everyone based on their own individual circumstance. He takes everything into consideration, everything imaginable, some things that we couldn't even potentially conceive. And only then after taking everything into consideration does he decide heaven or hell. And if we know the truth of Islam, because Alhamdulillah, our situation has allowed us to be exposed to the light of Islam, then we are grateful to God for it. And of course, we need to take it. If somebody sees that light of Islam and the truth of Islam and they reject it deliberately, then they enter the definition of the kuffar who are talked about in the Quran. But for many people, they're not necessarily exposed to that. 
they might have met a version of Islam which wasn't quite so good. They might have seen what was on the news and formed a false supposition, just like we might form about a Buddhism, for example, looking at Myanmar. You know, may Allah protect us from, 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 from such ignorance. And as such, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take that into consideration when judging them. So it's not like they get home scot-free, that they can do anything they want and they go to heaven. No, they have their own morals. For example, if they're a Christian and they try to live by their Christian creed, that'll be there for sure. Or if they know something that they're doing, that inherent sense we have in ourselves of moral duties and moral obligations to do the right thing, and they go against that. Well, it doesn't matter what label they get, even if they're labeled Muslims. I'm sorry, but uh, uh, Jahannam is waiting. So I hope that sort of answer, just to sort of summarize that down in uh, the, the first part, yes, non-Muslims will go to, uh, to heaven, some non-Muslims, um, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just and will reward them for their actions. And they may be non-Muslim because they haven't recognized the truth of Islam as we have recognized it, number one. And number two, it is fair because Allah adjusts the test to each individual so as to make the judgment fair. Last question, if you can briefly answer, what about the good atheist? Will they be able to go to heaven? Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> my answer is absolutely based on, on, on the text that I've read and the scholars that I've seen and based on basic philosophical understanding of the justice of God. The answer would be absolutely yes. There may well be, and I put this disclaimer, there may be Muslims who argue against that. I'm aware that there are probably some scholars who, who may uh, disagree, but basically the answer would, would be this. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges, let's say an atheist, uh, they have concluded outright God does not exist. Now the question is, were they sincere when they made that judgment and they committed to them, themselves to that belief? Did they really mean it? There are many atheists, for example, who are convinced and they may have looked into uh, the reasoning and the arguments behind the existence of God and looked at religion, so on and so forth. And still they're not convinced. And if they were genuinely sincere in their searching, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is judging them for that, fine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we think of God, he's not, he's not jealous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not petty. If someone doesn't subscribe to him, that doesn't offend him in any way. That belief in God is something which protects us. And so if they go down that path, thinking it is true, thinking it's right, and still trying to do the right thing within the realms of their actions, absolutely. Many atheists will go to heaven in that respect as the same way that many Muslims will not, because we will accept Islam. We will take this label, this superficial label that we put on our foreheads, right? And yet we'll go around on a daily basis committing sins. And in fact, in many ways, you know, may Allah protect us, in many ways we're much worse uh, than, than someone who denies God because we claim to believe in God and then practically we live a life which makes belief in God useless. People will look at us and say, oh my God, you know, this is a Muslim. Oh, I don't want to be anything like him. And we push people away, which is an even worse position to be in. So ultimately we look beyond the label because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks inside. And again, we return to Surah Zalzala. Uh, Okay, Jazakallah. So we will finish uh, our presentation today and uh, thank you for all the participants who asked these uh, questions. And uh, inshallah, we will follow on with the same theme at some stage later because I think still a few more questions coming on, but with the time limit, I think we will finish this presentation and inshallah, we'll come with a different perspective on this. And I'm sure and Dr. Hussain will be uh, quite kind to come up on this presentation again, <laughs> inshallah. So uh, thank you, Dr. Hassan, for coming again, for uh, giving this uh, very excellent talk. And I will thank all the participants. So I will say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to all the participants. Thank you.